Hi there guys, I've been out practicing some bushcraft today and I thought I'd just talk about two items I have here in front of me. I've got a Geit Designs 32 ounce stainless steel water bottle and a Vargo 750 milliliter titanium mug. And these are really the two main items that I take out with me when I'm cooking in the field or just carrying them around with me when I'm out practicing bushcraft. And handling hot pots and pans on a fire can be a little bit tricky. One thing I've been asked a number of times is how you attach these cables to each item. And this can be done with any pot and pan that has a lip at the top. But before I show you how you can actually attach these cables, I'm just going to build a simple pot hanger. And it allows you to see how these actually function and what the benefit of them are. So if we look at this tree here, this is hazel. And hazel's a very, very popular tree in bushcraft and one you'll find all throughout the British Isles and certain parts of Europe. A very, very common tree and it's where hazelnuts come from. Corlea savalagna is its scientific name and it's a member of the silver birch family. But if we look at some of the branches you'll see that some of them are very young. We've got little new sort of saplings coming through just at the base here and some of them are actually dead as well and you can generally tell when they're dead because they have a lichen on them, a spotted lichen and the bark starts to kind of flake off and um, if we just bend this branch you'll see it just sheared straight off and broke. And that doesn't damage the tree at all, but it just sheds some dead weight. And this is another useful reason why hazel is so great, is because when it's raining very heavily, these branches will be standing there. And it's basically just high and dry wood for you to go and collect and break off, break down and make a fire out of, and they'll always be dry in the core. If we look at the bark a little closer, you'll see that there's these horizontally wrapped lines going all the way around them, and they're everywhere. And these are lenticels, and this is something that's shared in all areas of flora really. It's just a means at which gases can pass through, but a great way of identifying the tree nonetheless if you get a close-up of the bark in the winter when there's no leaves. But again, the appearance of the tree alone should really give it away as it sprawls out the ground in all these thin limbs, unlike other trees that are generally a lot thicker. The leaves alone are very easy to identify when the tree has leaves. You can see it's oval shaped with a point at the end, almost a little bit like elm. And it has these severe veins running through them. And you can sort of see that from the top of the leaf or the underside, the underside's a bit clearer. And at the end of each vein, it's kind of like a dominant tooth with smaller ones in between. This piece here looks pretty good. You can see there's lots of joints in it. We've got a small joint just coming off there, which would be pretty good as a pot hanger. Another bit further up, which can be the Y. We've even got a Y here and a nice straight piece if we choose to use that, which I think I probably will. So we've got quite a lot of options, so it's best to get everything out of one limb. Coppicing hazel isn't a bad thing, it grows so quick. It's just taking it the right way, and not taking too much. I've got a hatchet on me today. Normally I use a saw and I'd recommend using a saw for this if you have one, just because it makes it a lot cleaner and a lot easier. And you can do a bit of a cleaner joint at an angle then, and then water will run off and it won't get rotted and infected and then new shoots can come out. And um, it's just a healthy way of taking a limb off a hazel tree and uh, encouraging a bit of growth in the meantime. But obviously I need to be careful with the hatchet, so I'm just gonna take a stage back and support the branch and just come in from the side here. Taking it down, nice and low. So now this is out, I can just pull this backward and free it up. If you're a fair way from camp and you have a saw, it's best just to process it right there, but because I've got a tump here, I prefer working with the hatchet on the tump. It gives me a cleaner cut and it's a bit safer. Looking at this limb here, I've got quite a few options, but this is going to be my straight. I'm going to get my pot hanger from this part here and take my Y from a little bit further up. And I've plenty of spare wood to make a peg out of, so I'm just going to start processing this down. <laughs> There's my straight piece.
And there's the Y. This part here can make quite a useful peg. So we've got most of the components we need. We've got the Y, we've got the straight component, and obviously most of that will be pushed in the grain. So do allow for quite a bit of it to be pushed in the grain. You need to judge the soil as well. When we assemble this, things will sort of become a bit clearer. And we've got the pot hanger part that goes on the end there. So we've pretty much got all the components. And I did manage to salvage a peg, although, I mean, it would be okay, but I probably want to find something a little bit more substantial out of the wood I just put behind me there, but we can always do that at the end, obviously once we start to put it together. So the first thing I'm going to do with this is pop a point on the end. You can use a knife for this, but this is a small piece of wood and uh, I've got the hatchet, so it won't take very long. Something like that would be absolutely fine, it doesn't need to be the best point in the world or a work of art. It's going to be stabbed in the ground and if you make it too sharp, it will just blunt anyway. If you want a, a point to last a long time, for example on reusable tent pegs, if you're making them out of hazel, make a bullet shape and um, that'll be very, very strong then and it won't kind of fray when it goes in the ground. And to make it even stronger, you can do what they used to do with arrows and push it in the ashes of a fire so there's no oxygen and it can't burn and it'll just cure and all the sap will come out and it'll be rock hard. But something like this will be absolutely fine. The next thing we want to do is just take our knife there and bevel the top. And bevelling is where you just take the edge of the grain off and often you do this with pegs and things you'd hammer in the ground. You see it on fence posts and it just stops the mushrooming out, stops the grain fraying away around the edge where you're hitting it and just makes it a bit neater. You can use your thumb to just push against the knife, just nip the edge of the grain off. And it just makes it a little bit tougher. You can always round it off a little bit as well. That'll make it even stronger. You can always use this method as well. If you don't want to get your knuckles and your thumbs too close if you're not comfortable with that, but I don't really mind it. So there you go. And notice I'm not doing the other one because I'm not going to be hitting that. If I hit that to put this in the ground, it would split straight off. But this is the main line there, which is why you don't want a Y that's almost too pronounced. You don't want it like this. Because if you hit the middle, you'll split it. If you hit either one, you'll split it. You almost want a main trunk with a little sapling coming off of it. It's much easier to put in the ground that way. I'm going to put it just here. With the Y hammered securely in the ground, there's a few things you want to consider before you move on. You want to take your straight and place it in the Y and determine where you want it to go. I generally make sure one third of it's hanging over the edge and two thirds are hanging back. The straight I've got in the demo is a little bit too short, but it'll be all right in this case, just for show. If the straight has any bends in it, and at this moment you don't check where its positioning is in the Y, you may make your carving sit it in there, and it will then start to shift and move around to try and find its natural center of gravity. So place the straight in the Y, mark out where you want it to go, and make sure the fire will be further enough away from the actual wire itself as not to burn it. I've got the piece of wood in my left hand here because obviously I'm using the axe with my dominant hand, my right hand, and I've got the mark that I've made facing outward to my right hand side there. So it's facing the cut. I'm cutting into where I've put that mark. And what we're going to make is a flathead screwdriver. And I'll quickly make mine and you'll see what I mean. What we can do now is sit it on our Y, just like this, and decide whether it's at the right angle. You really want it to be quite flat towards the end, so we'll just turn this around, which is actually slightly better. And you can just kind of finish it off. Just remove any material that you need to.
and that should be absolutely fine. I'll just move it out to about there. And there we go. And we can actually peg the back down now. Making the peg shouldn't be difficult given its size. Um, but what you want to do is just bevel the top again. I mean, this is a fairly rubbishy peg, but it'll do the job. Because you're going to be hitting this part of it, so you can just round that off very slightly. And um, just put a point on it. So one thing you can do to this post here is just put a nick in it like that and it just helps the peg bite in and you don't want the peg to be here or here you want the peg to be as low down as possible so we're going to pop it just here and make sure it sits in that notch and if you feel like the peg's in the ground don't sort of hammer it or you'll just split it an alternative is just placing a big stone just on the end which works too. So now it's time to make the pot hanger and uh, this is probably by far one of the most important parts. Most of this bit here is just about it being structurally sound. This bit here though you need to do some decent carving, nothing too fancy but just enough to keep it biting onto that screwdriver like jaw at the end. But what I might do first is just tidy up the edges with a bit of beveling because by using the axe they're a little bit chewed up. So at least it's tidied up a little bit. But now we need to do some notches just along this neck here. I've got an offcut of wood here and that's going to act as a little batten for me. But what we want to do is just inspect the piece of wood we've got, see how straight it is. If it's got a huge curve and kink in it, it will affect the centre of gravity and it can then hang in a in sort of peculiar fashion. I always make the notches along the inside because I just find it hangs a lot better. And we're going to make three and bear in mind where these knots are because I'm going to be avoiding those. So my first one will go here and we're going to make an X. Don't want to go in too far, that's probably far enough to be quite honest. And that should do. And then we'll do another, I reckon about here. So you can see I'm going in quite far, but not all the way to the pith. If you go through to the pith, you've really gone too far. It wants to be just before. The pith is the core of the wood and it's brown on hazel. It's quite distinct really. I'm going to make one at the top as well and that's for the full boil. Also make the beaks quite steep. These probably aren't quite steep enough, but I generally finish them off in a second and I'll show you how to do that. So that's it. So we've got three notches, we could even make one more there, you could make another there. You can make as many as you like, three is just a kind of standard really. So you can see I've just turned my side to it, I generally work away from my inner leg. It's definitely a safe practice to do that as I'm sure many know. And um, the reason I'm doing that is because I just want to work in a bit closer to myself because you get a little bit more control than being all the way over there. So I'm just going to use something called a power cut where you just rotate your wrist, just take away the bottom of the V. And you can work up the sides as well and drop the blade down a bit more. Take away that uh, excess wood. And you want it to be fairly long. You can see we've got a little knot there. So, you know, you've got quite a lot of clearance. Got a few knots here, but on this one, but don't worry about these shavings because what you can do 
is just take the knife and press it down and just free them up and it just cleans up the carving quite a lot you know a two stage cut is absolutely fine on that so you can see the beak isn't quite steep enough so what I'm going to do is just take my knife and just carve away the edges keep making sure my hands and legs are quite clear and that's probably how steep it should be a little bit like that but you can see there that's not too bad got a lot of clearance there I usually take away the bark gives you a false sense of security because it's so soft it really doesn't mean anything and it looks a bit like a tooth and it's kind of like a beak but you can see it's flat there we want it to be kind of cutting in a bit so it actually points down so what you can do is just take your knife and press underneath it not all the way at the edge so you've got a tiny little point there about two mil down and just free up the sides as well try and cut away those pieces of wood and I don't have to put too much pressure down anymore I can just do some very light work And we can try that on our tooth on the end of our long stick and see how that holds up. So when we place this on the end of here, you can see it sits quite well. And, um, and it sits quite comfortably there and you know we can knock it about, but it will eventually come off because there's one more thing we need to do. So what you want to do is when you've made your beak, just place it just there. Take your knife and place it just at the point of the beak. Take the beak away. Make sure your hands and legs are free and don't press too hard, you really don't need to. Just scooping away a tiny bit of that hazel there. Just literally spooning it out with the knife as opposed to drilling the point in. If you push too hard you'll just split straight through because it's green wood. And if your legs are there you'll, you'll go into them. So we've made a little indentation now and the beak can just slot in and rock like a pendulum almost so when your pots are on the end and they've got weight on them they're really going to pull it down into that notch and it will stay in there even if you knock it just like this my only tip really would be after watching all of that is that you need to go out and do it like everything really once you've gone out there and actually done it you'll see all the variables and all the things that you need to do it's just it's just very basic it's just one of those practical things that make sense when you do it almost like all bushcraft tasks but a little tip would be that the underside of this screwdriver needs to be flat. It can't be sticking out too much or else what you'll find will happen is it will push this out further and then you'll put your indentation really close to the edge, the grain will split and the whole thing will come out, especially when you've got your food on there. So you want it to be fairly deep really so it's got that bite. And don't go too deep onto this so you can see the pith again or things are just going to start to fall apart really you need the integrity of the wood there especially when you're working with green wood it's not so bad when you know it's been cured but we'll make the rest of the indentations sorry the notches and um, then we can put our pots on and see how it works so I've made the rest of the notches and they all match up pretty well to that notch there and you can see we've got various adjustments going on and what we can actually do and with the weight of the pot it keeps it central every time the more weight that the pot has in it, obviously the better this thing will function. And you can see there we could have some food in that, have a fairly small fire, just the residual heat of the fire, keeping our food warm. If we actually want to then heat it up a bit, drop it down a little bit further, and you can heat your food up. And maybe you want to sterilise some water, you want it right in the embers, cooking away, boiling away, you know, nice and hot. So it gives you a variety of things that you can do with it. And obviously when you want to take your pot off the fire you can just pick it off like this and then you have 180 degrees all the way around your camp that you can move around and be fairly comfortable with. It also means that when you're pouring a drink you can do it in a sort of controlled manner just by keeping the pot levered on the pot hanger like that. And it means you're not sort of burning yourself or you're minimising the risk of burning yourself basically 
which is the most important thing. But let's have a look at how these wires are attached. So I have some steel wire here, and this is six twist steel wire, and I just bought this from a hardware store. It was something like 45p for a couple of metres worth. But it's absolutely perfect and there's no plastic lining on the inside because sometimes with these steel wires or cables you have a plastic film on the inside. This can be removed with heat uh, or just by pulling it out in a certain way but best to get yourself some stuff that doesn't have that in and save yourself the hassle. Um, but it's fairly flexible stuff so you just want to test it before you buy it and make sure it's steel so it can hold up in any kind of temperature really. But what I've got threaded onto them is some electrical connectors. And these are the brass blocks you get out of those white figure of eight electrical connectors that you buy. And I'll put a link in the description if you're unsure about what I mean, you can have a look at an image. Um, but you just cut them out, cut the brass block out. They have two screws. And all you're doing to thread them around the lip of the pot, for example, is you're just making a loop like that and then fastening the screws on. And doing exactly the same the other side, so you do this when it's on the pot, we'll, we'll do it in a sec. So those two are wrapped around and then this bit here is free on the top here. So you've got like a portion that's excess to actually hang on the pot hanger. So if we just assemble that now, you'll see how easy it actually is. So we just want to put that round. Like that. Pop that in there, you can undo the screws a bit, so it's just literally like that. You sometimes need to pull the main length of line through just to tighten it up a bit and that can cause a few problems but got away with it there. Might need a little screwdriver or a multi-tool just to do it up. And you can do it up nice and tight. You can see that's one of them done. You know, it's just on there. And then we do the other one. So that comes round here. Just goes underneath. It's threading through by accident, so it can come round, just go underneath. And you're just putting it back in. It's a lot easier if you've got fresh wire, because it doesn't fray so much. Obviously, I've taken this out a few times. I've lost one of the screws there. It's okay. And then we'll just, you can see obviously the loop's too big, so we'll just pull on the main line that's going to actually be our pot hanger, just to tighten it up. And you can sometimes put your thumb there, you know, just to stop the piece you've pushed in from coming out like that. And just put that screw back in. So what you should be left with is something like this and these bolts will move around freely and you can loosen them up to get the pot hanger part out like that and just brush it over the top and if you bend these slightly and uh, have some water in it the centre of gravity will actually make it a bit more true instead of you having to kind of adjust the bolts to find the right drop on it but when you're finished with it you just pull the bolts back and it tucks away underneath the lip and you know you can um, just obviously put that in your pack and it won't interfere with anything. So you can see once it's finished it tucks nicely under the lip of the mug and you can do this on most mugs with a lip. You just push on those two little bolts there, it frees up the wire and you just pop that on your pot hanger and you can sterilise your water and do your cooking and you know then take it off and actually handle it by putting a twig through the back of the handle and pouring and it just basically minimises the chance of you burning yourself which is what it's all about and just makes cooking a lot easier in the field and it's exactly the same on the Guide Designs bottle. I've made my one quite long but you can shorten it very easily by just doing a figure of eight and then dropping the top loop down and it just makes it a lot smaller so when you put it on the pot hanger um, you know you're bringing it up a little bit more if you didn't kind of make the design properly um, but normally I just sterilise water in this pot so I have it as low down in the fire as possible really, right in the embers with the flames surrounding it, getting a really quick boil on the go. Whereas this one's a bit smaller because I need it to be a bit more kind of sensitive in terms of cooking food because I want to control the heat a bit more. So guys, I hope that video helped out and with putting the pot hanger on the Guide Designs bottle and the mug, you can do it with any number of different things, even on a titanium plate 
although it might be a bit iffy, you probably have to do kind of three pieces of cord instead of the two, but you know, it might be worth a go if you really want to do something like that. But thanks again for watching and really appreciate you, you know, watching the videos and um, hope you enjoy what's to come and uh, thanks again and I'll see you in the next vid. Take care.